The sorting algorithms that we talked about so far are all O of n squared. They all run in quadratic time, in polynomial time. Now, there are a bunch of variations on these algorithms. For instance, we saw the, the version of bubble sort that allows you to exit early rather than going through the whole thing every time. There are variations on these algorithms which make small differences in how fast they are, but in general, they are also n squared. But there are also a bunch of better algorithms that are actually O of n log n, which is faster. Quicksort is one of the simpler ones of these. The big idea is we want to break an array into two parts and then move elements around so that all the larger values are on one end and all the smaller values are on the other end. Then we take each of those two parts and we subdivide it the same way and we do that over and over and over again until the subparts only have a single value. And at that point, we know that the array is sorted. So let's dive right into an example. You know, you remember the first thing that we want to check for is to make sure that we haven't hit one of our stopping conditions, which is that if the subarray that we're looking at has a length of one, we know we're done and we know the array is in sorted order. So the first thing we're going to check is whether the array that we're looking at is less than two in length, and in, in which case we'd be done here. That's not the case because you can see our unsorted array up here at the top. So then we need to choose our pivot value. In this presentation, we're going to choose our pivot by using the middle element of the array. Some quicksort implementations choose pivot otherwise. In our case, this is how we're going to do it. So here, the pivot is 7. Then we tag the elements at the left and right end of the array as i and j, and we adjust i and j, bringing them closer to the pivot until we, they're both on values that are out of place. In this case, that's 12 and 4. 12 is supposed to be to the right of the pivot, 4 is supposed to be to the left of the pivot. Now here we want to check if our tags have crossed each other. If they have crossed each other, then we know we're at the end of the phase. But in this case, they haven't crossed each other, so we swap the elements at i and j. Now we've put 4 on the correct side of the pivot, and we've put 12 on the correct side of the pivot as well. We'll increment i and decrement j. We're going to keep going, uh, repeating step 4. That means changing i and j until we found two values that are out of place. In other words, values greater than the pivot to the left and values less than the pivot to the right. We'll check to see if our tags have crossed. In this case, they still haven't crossed yet, so we don't end the phase. And because of that, we'll swap the elements at i and j, which we know were both out of place at the beginning. Once again, we'll go back to step six. We'll increment i, decrement j, and in this case, i is still not greater than j, so we don't yet end the phase. Once again, we'll keep incrementing i and decrementing j until we've found values that are less than or greater than the pivot value, respectively. And as you can see, we've hit our stopping condition because i and j have crossed. j is now to the left of i. So we end the phase. We're now going to split the array into two subarrays from 0 to j and from i to 10, which to help you see are shaded here. So the first subarray is shaded, the second one is white. One thing to notice, all the elements in the left array are less than or equal to the pivot. All the elements in the right subarray are greater than or equal to the pivot. So now for the next phase, we're just going to do the same thing to the left and right subarrays. And then we'll divide each of those into two subarrays and so on until the subarrays have length one at most. And that's how quicksort goes. So what we've seen here is just the first phase of a quicksort. We do this over and over again with smaller and smaller halves of the array. So suppose we want to do a little informal analysis of quicksort's complexity, its time complexity. During the first phase, we start i and j at either end, and we move them toward each other. And every time, at every move, either an element is getting compared to the pivot, or we're doing a swap. As soon as i and j pass each other, the whole process stops. So we know that the amount of work that we're doing during phase one is roughly proportional to n, which is the length of the array. After we do our first subdivision and we enter phase two, the work that we're doing in that phase is proportional to the left subarray's length plus the right subarray's length, which we know together equal n. And when we divide them again for phase three, well, now we end up with our total number of elements divided into four chunks, all of which also add up to n. So during every phase, we're still doing work proportional to n, the number of elements in the array. That's for each phase. Now, to finish up the analysis, we have to think about how many times the arrays are actually subdivided. So we're going to assume that every time 
the dividing line turns out to be as close to the center as possible. Now, this is not usually the case, but still. If you remember from thinking about the binary search algorithm, when we divide an array in half over and over again, we get to a single element in about log base 2 of n steps, if n is the number of elements we're starting with. So, this algorithm ends up being O of n log n. That first n comes from the amount of work we're doing during each phase to uh, move our tags from the outer bounds toward the center, and the log n comes from how many times we actually have to subdivide, so how many phases we need to have. Now that log n, that's a best case scenario. The worst case would be if our pivot ended up being really badly chosen, and it took us way more than log n divisions to get down to single element arrays. And in that case, we'd be doing n phases of work and n subdivisions, which would mean our worst case scenario here is n squared. So in the best case, it's substantially faster than an n squared uh, sorting algorithm. In the worst case, it is an n squared sorting algorithm. I encourage you to try to think of what kind of a pivot would take the complexity of a quicksort and take it from n log n to n squared. That'd be a worthwhile exercise to think through. What's the nightmare quicksort scenario that leads to that situation? You can implement quicksort using either iterative or recursive code, but the iterative approach actually uses a data structure called a stack, which we haven't learned yet. You won't really touch them until we get to analysis of algorithms. So because we've described the algorithm recursively, we might as well implement it that way, and you can see that here. Uh, take a minute, pause the video, read through this, and, uh, and see to it that you understand what's going on here. Uh, don't be thrown by the abbreviated syntax of the while loops here. Uh, you can see there, there's only one statement in each of these while loops, so don't let that throw you for a loop. If it's helpful to you, here's a version of the quicksort recursive implementation with some illustrative print statements added in so you can track what's happening. Uh, you can pause that, take a look. And here's a version of the trace output that that segment of code actually outputs. You can see it's in three columns because it's a bit long. Uh, but if you'd like, pause the video, pick through this a little bit, uh, or download the code and run it yourself. Okay, before you close up shop, make sure you can tell me how quicksort works and how it brings sorting's complexity from n squared down to n log n. Uh, think of a worst case scenario for quicksort, which I would actually force it back up to n squared runtime. And see if you can think up three different strategies for how you might select a pivot in quicksort. Uh, and, and think about what, what impact that might have. Uh, finally, here's an idea to chew on a little bit. Uh, when you're sorting an array in quicksort, if the length gets to be less than some number, you know, pick 50 numbers out of a hat, uh, use an insertion sort to get the rest of the way there, to process the subarray. Why might that be a good idea? Think on it for a bit, and uh, that's it for today.